All right. Thank you very much for having me. I cannot believe I'm here. It's so far away from where I live, but also so exciting to be here. So thank you so much to Monash University for having me out for the next two weeks. And I'm really glad that the timing worked out to um, be able to give this talk today. So today I wanna to talk about what's new, new in the tidyverse. As Emmy mentioned, um, I work with the tidyverse team pretty closely, um, mostly in terms of sort of developing educational uh, materials for it, but oftentimes developing educational materials after something is built isn't necessarily the best way to go about things. So um, I very much enjoy being able to sort of be involved with the development process, thinking about things from the perspective of learners and educators. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, very quickly, about the tidyverse. I assume a lot of you know about it, um, but turns out it is more than just those cute hex um, logos that we saw here. But if you're here for those, I'm going to put them here so that you can pick them up afterwards. Um, yeah, that's like one perk of working at Posit. You can always get these hex uh, stickers. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, principles of the Tidyverse. So Tidyverse itself is a meta R package that loads nine core packages when invoked. And what's special about these packages is that they share a design philosophy, a common grammar, and data structures. So this is what it looks like when you first load the Tidyverse. Um, and when we think about this um, sort of uh, figure from R for data science in terms of the data science uh, cycle, we can see that many of these packages map on to many of the steps of uh, the data science cycle. Um, I'm going to use the Palmer Penguins uh, data set, the Penguins data set from the Palmer Penguins package for some of my examples here. And for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it is a data set of a uh, little over 300 uh, penguins and we have some body measurements on them that are numerical variables and a couple categorical variables like species, island, and sex. And this is what a typical tidyverse pipeline looks like. So you can see that we start with the data frame, we do some stuff to it, and then we visualize it. And this is what a typical tidyverse workflow looks like. You start with a data frame, and then you say, I want to group my data by species and sex, and then I want to, let's say, calculate the mean body weight of these penguins. And then you realize, oh, there's a warning, I wonder what that means, or a message, and then you sort of adjust to it. Um, um, there are some NAs we were seeing here, and I'm going to send the output, and I'm going to say, let's just drop those NAs. Let's take care of the message about our data being uh, grouped, which I'm going to say a bit more about a little later in the talk. And then, now that I have a data set that I can visualize, I can pipe this into a visualization sort of pipeline and uh, make a bar plot. And that, does, that bar plot doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Maybe something like this where the bars are dodged makes a little bit more sense. Frankly, as a statistician, these sorts of plots really bother me <laughs> where you're sort of uh, plotting the mean without any sort of, um, um, sort of data about the uh, variability within each of these groups. But regardless, as a typical tidyverse pipeline, I would say this is sort of the thing you might do the first day you start learning Tidyverse. So let's keep that in mind, and let's talk a little bit about um, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Sometimes I'm going to show you a slide that looks like this, where it says previously you used to do this, and now you should do this. But most of the time in the presentation, I'm going to say previously you used to do this in the tidyverse, and now you can do this. And you'll see that the latter will be a lot more often. Uh, so while I'm talking about the updates to the tidyverse, I'm not mostly talking about changes to the tidyverse where you absolutely have to change your code. It's just sort of quality of life improvements mostly for you to either make your code more readable or more efficient or some combination of those. And because I can't help myself, I'm going to sprinkle in some teaching tips along the way as well. So let's start with Tidyverse 2.0, which was released this year. Um, and there are two things in this meta package that are new. One is the Lubridate package is now a core Tidyverse package. And the other one is that package loading message got even longer. So let's take a peek at what those are. Um, the Lubridate package um, is an incredibly useful package with a incredibly not so great name in my opinion. Um, but it is a package that makes it really 
much easier to work with date times. So maybe previously you used to do this at the beginning of your uh, R scripts or documents, and now you can just get away with doing this, just the library tidyverse. And this is what Lubridate functionality looks like. I'm going to give sort of three progressively, I think, more annoying to parse strings. One of them is just today's date as a um, numeric value, the other one's a text string, and the other one is an actual sentence. What we can do is we can take each one of these and apply the appropriate uh, Liberdate function. So in this case, the data is in the order of year, month, and date. So then I apply YMD, and we can see that it turns it into a date class. Um, I can do the same thing where the data is in the order of MDY, or I can say, just take that sentence and figure out in there a date, month, and year, and an hour as well. And it does a pretty good job of doing so, and you can also supply time zones to it if that's the sort of thing that you tend to work with, and if so, I am sorry. <laughs> um, uh, and then um, it will give you a POSIX CT um, class. So this is, I think, pretty neat. And what is really neat about this is that, particularly for that last example, it lets you get away with not having to write regular expressions. And to me, that is a huge quality of life improvement. The other one is that message that I said got longer. So when we load the tidyverse, now we can see um, an additional informational point that says, use the conflicted package to force all conflicts to become errors. So what does that mean? Um, it basically, we can explicitly check for conflicts with when we load the tidyverse with um, uh, existing loaded packages. And in this case, I'm loading the tidyverse before loading any other thing. So this is the conflicts with base R, basically, or the stats package in this case. Filter and lag are functions that exist there that uh, tidyverse is overwriting or dplyr. If the conflict resolution uh, with base R looks something like this, it just gives precedence to the most recently loaded package. So if I have not loaded the tidyverse yet, and I try to do something like filter for the species where the penguins are Adelie, it will give me a error that's not like I can't find the filter function. In fact, it's giving me the error of what would, the, what would this sort of expression passed on to stats filter would look like. After loading the tidyverse, base R will silently use the last loaded package and things work nicely, until they don't, I suppose. Um, with conflicted, what you can see is that if that package is loaded, the error is a little bit different. It is saying that I am not going to just use one of the uh, ones. It's saying there are two um, packages that have the filter function and you need to explicitly choose. And you can explicitly choose with sort of a method that doesn't require conflicted at all by saying um, uh, which package name and then colon colon the function. Or you can say, I'm going to use filter a lot. I know that I want the dplyr filter going forward. So for this session, I want to prefer dplyr filter. So from that point onwards in my session, it is going to use um, the dplyr filter. So this is making things a lot more explicit, which when things are going fine is almost overhead, frankly, but when they're not, um, it's actually one of the more annoying, I think, uh, uh, error messages to sort of figure out when you're using the wrong uh, function from a package you didn't intend to, and this can grow to be an even bigger problem when you have lots of packages that might have sort of name conflicts. So a little bit of teaching tip around this. I said that the tidyverse message, loading the tidyverse message got even longer now, and I did hear the sigh, and I am with you on that, but I think that it is important to show these startup messages in the teaching materials and not hide them. Especially if you teach with slides, I know that it is so tempting to hide them because they take up so much space. But I think it's important to address them early on because first of all, you want to model good behavior. You can't ask your students to read error messages if you don't read them yourself or any messages for that matter. So it, it encourages reading and understanding messages, warnings, and errors, and what the distinction between them are. And also it helps uh, during hard to debug situations that result from base R's silent conflict resolution. That's definitely going to be something that will be even harder for especially new learners. 
That being said, do show your students how to hide those, particularly at like editing or polishing a document stage. All right, so let's talk about dplyr, which got a lot of updates over the last year. Um, many, many updates that sort of expanded its functionality. So I am going to talk about a few things um, that cross my path on almost a daily basis. This is a non-exhaustive list. Um, so at the end, I will point you to other places where you can read about um, other advances in dplyr. Uh, one of them is improved and expanded join functionality. One of them is added functionality for per operation grouping. And the other one is some quality of life improvements to case one and if else, case one happens to be my favorite function if I had to pick one. So that's why I'm highlighting it. And there are a few more. So let's start with the joins. Um, there is a new join by function that we can use for the by argument in any of the join functions. And the uh, new jo join functions have all gained new arguments that allow us to handle various matches like one to one, one to many, many to many relationships as well as explicitly handling on much cases. So let's start with join by. Previously, maybe you did something like this, and even, I don't know, somehow seems crazier to me that you could actually get away with not putting these quotes here as well, because that's how you would define a uh, named vector in R. Now, optionally, you can do this. So this is optional, but I do think it is a quality of life improvement where we're passing a join by function and then we can actually use uh, sort of um, the non-standard evaluation to not have to quote our variable names. So what does that look like? I'm gonna make up a data set. This is real data, but not necessarily the most useful data. Here are the coordinates for the three islands that appear in our um, penguins data set. And what we're going to do is we are going to join these to our data. With by alone, you could do something like this, where, um, and just to uh, remind, this, the data frame name is islands, and the name of the island is in a column called name. So we can say, take the penguins data frame and then left joined it such that the island in the penguins data frame matches um, name in the islands data frame. Or you can do something like this, where you can actually articulate things as, uh, take the penguins data frame, left join it to the islands data frame where island is equal to name in the two. So we can actually can use these uh, sort of logical operation that we use elsewhere um, in R as well. So my recommendation from a teaching perspective would be to use join by, particularly because you can read it, aloud, read it out loud as where X is equal to Y, which is something you probably already say if you do tend to read your code out loud wherever you have the double equal sign. Um, and also, you don't have to worry about the various ways of um, sort of passing named vectors where you can't have both of them uncoded here. This would be invalid, but either this or um, this would be valid. And personally for me, I find um, you know, being able to teach joins early on to be a win, <laughs> being able to talk about named vectors early on to be not as big a win, not that they're not important, but something that can come a little bit later perhaps. Um, so it helps you avoid some awkward conversations, I would say. Um, now let's talk a little bit about handling various matches. So previously join functions look something like this. A few more arguments, but mostly two data frames that you're joining and a by argument. And now they have a few new arguments as well um, with extensive documentation around them. But I wanna just highlight a few cases that might cross your path um, and that might come in handy. Um, as a setup, we're going to create three data frames. Uh, one of them is a data frame of just three penguins. These are just three randomly selected penguins from our data frame, and we know their species and the island name. Another data frame is something hopefully realistic where if you are measuring anything in a scientific setting, chances are you are measuring things multiple times and averaging them or something like that. So this data frame indicates that for those three penguins, we have their sample IDs and also a measurement ID where instead of weighing the penguin once, we, made each pe we weighed each penguin twice. So we have a measurement ID of one and two for both. 
and the same thing for their flipper length as well. So we have these three data frames. You can perhaps imagine a situation where different people have collected these data. Um, now, one-to-many relationships, things work out pretty nicely. I have my three penguins data frame that, I remember, had three rows, a row per penguin. And I have joined it to the weight measurements data frame, and everything looks fine. It's basically my measurements joined with the species and island of those penguins. Not much to think about here. Um, now, with many too many relationships, on the other hand, we get a warning. So here, I am taking my weight measurements data frame, maybe from one of the scientists, and the flipper measurements data frame from the other, and I just say, just bring them together by sample ID, and I get a warning saying that row one of your first data frame matches multiple rows in your second data frame, and row one of your second data frame matches multiple rows in your second one, and it says, if you want to silence this, tell me that you are, in fact, intending to do a many-to-many -many match. So we can go ahead and do that. Um, we can go ahead and say, I do want to make a many-to-many -many match. Does this look correct? What do we have here? We had one scientist take two measurements each on three penguins, so six measurements, and another scientist take two measurements each on the same three penguins. So another six measurements. And somehow what happened is I ended up with a 12 row data frame. So I have an explosion of rows, which doesn't seem so bad when your options are six versus 12, but you can imagine a scenario where this could be problematic if you had a large data, two large data sets that you're joining. What actually is happening is that we probably should have joined by both sample ID and measurement ID. Right, so instead of joining by a single variable, the penguin or the sample ID, we probably should have joined by both so that we ultimately have six, row six rows in our data frame with measurements coming from the two scientists. So the takeaway message here is that one, the many-to-many -many relationships can be costly, particularly computationally, so the warnings are helpful to stop you and make you think, but the warnings themselves aren't enough to get you to the right answer necessarily. So the warning that we saw here was simply talking about, I'm observing something happening here, and I want you to be explicit about whether you want that to happen. And this is where the human needs to, sorry, this is where the human needs to come into play and say, I know something about this data set. Joining by these two uh, variables makes a bit more sense. Now let's do one more thing. I'm going to bring in one more penguin. So we had three penguins. I'm adding in one more, an Adelie penguin from the Bisco Island. And now let's join that the four penguins data set to our weight measurements data set. Remember, three uh, penguins were measured so far. And what I've done is I've said, I'm going to take the weight measurements from my, one of my scientists, and I'm going to join it with my four penguins data set to get the information on the penguins. And what happened to the fourth penguin? Poof, it's gone. Um, and that's potentially what we intended to do. I mean, I explicitly selected left join here, right? I am saying keep all the rows in the left data frame and don't worry about the rows in the right data frame. Maybe that is true, but um, if you have a large data frame where you can't really see all of the rows, where it's not so hot, obvious what d disappeared or did not disappear, that can be a pretty risky move. So one thing you can do with a new argument unmatched is say, if anything is going to go poof, just give me an error first. So let me stop me in my tracks before I continue. And I think that this sort of introduces a paradigm of programming where you're not just like writing things and then just like expecting a whole document to render because you wrote the code correctly. It actually is um, making you to explicitly use um, sort of the code that you're writing to check if what you're doing is indeed what you're intending to do. So in this case, it says, if there are any unmatched cases that are going to go poof, just error out and let me think about it. And it did say that row four of why that fourth penguin was not matched. So now I, as the analyst, have two options. I can say, Maybe I just wanted to do an inner join where I wanted to make sure that, um, that basically 
the matching penguins are the only ones that I want. Or I could say that if there are any unmatched ones, just drop them, which is the exact same result I had at the very beginning. The difference being that I am intentionally sort of doing this and nothing is just sort of disappearing under my, uh, like without me realizing. Or you can just do nothing. You can just go with the default. So the defaults work just as you would expect, but they don't necessarily allow you to catch yourself making errors. And chances are you're working with more than three penguins at a time. And it is a lot easier to sort of um, introduce these errors, particularly if you write in pipelines. If you're like me, chances are you're like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna left join. We're, you know, My first data frame is on the left. I'm just going, I think I know what I'm doing. But if you don't know your data really well, it can be a risky move. Um, and there are a bit more on joins as well. So we talked about join by, we talked about different ways of handling relationships and unmatched cases. There are two other exciting developments that are inequality joins and rolling joins that are basically all made possible because now instead of saying, take this one variable from the first data frame and this variable from the data frame, I actually into the join by function can pass on um, expressions that say something like less than or greater than or whatnot. If you wanna read more about these, I have included some resources here and I'll share the link to the slides at the end as well. And if you're thinking what in the world are inequality joins and rolling joins, if you know, you know, okay, that, that is the reality. And I personally, for me, they don't cross my path as often as some of the other things do, but I also don't tend to work a lot with sort of time series-ish data sets, I think where these come into play a bit more. That being said, we do have a new section in the second edition of R for Data Science that is dedicated to the various types of joins that you can do. And these are also moves that you can easily do with data table package and in, a, uh, in SQL as well. So basically these um, sort of expanded functionality in uh, dplyr is sort of matching other tools that you could use in order to achieve the same um, outcome. All right, and in terms of a teaching tip, I would say that the exploding joins, particularly where we just ended up with like extra rows where we didn't intend, can be um, hard to debug for students. Uh, because I think joins are like inherently, in my experience, relatively straightforward to teach and relatively straightforward to learn, but diagnosing when, um, you know, uh, cases sort of disappear, or when they gain an unexpected amount of cases, um, or performing a join without thinking and taking down an entire teaching server, which tends to happen whenever we do sort of open-ended projects with our students. These things do happen. So um, I think that teaching some of these sort of defensive strategies of coding is it, using them for your own use is good. And I think teaching them can be helpful as well, particularly if you're expecting that students will be working with data that might be unfamiliar to them, where they may not have the intuition to be like, wait, why did I just all of a sudden get 12 rows here? Like we were able to do so earlier. Um, another exciting um, functionality in dplyr and new functionality is per operation grouping. So previously, grouped summaries, for example, looked something like this. You take a data frame, you group by a variable, and then you can maybe calculate a summary statistic. Now, optionally, you can do this a slightly different way, where you say summarize, and instead of group by happening in a previous step, it is actually happening in summarize. And again, this is optional, group by is not going anywhere, but it is something you might consider. Um, let's take a look at this. Remember this typical tidyverse pipeline I showed earlier? And we actually did set dot groups equals drop here. So let's think about why did we do that? If I don't do that, I end up with this uh, message. It says summarize has grouped by output by species, and you can override this using the dot groups argument. So what? What happened is I had grouped by species and sex, and then when I ran the summarize function after that, it almost peels away one layer of grouping and leaves the data frame grouped behind it. But frankly, 
it doesn't matter. I get the same ggplot at the end. I don't really care that it was grouped to begin with. Turns out in this particular setting, I don't care. What if I was doing something else? What if, for example, I was saying, I want to group by these two variables. I want to calculate the mean body mass. And then finally, I want to um, get the top row. So I'm going to say slice head and give me the top row. These are two different outputs. Comes. And in one of them, I am explicit, I am not doing anything to address the grouping over here. And uh, here I am dropping the groups. And we can see that the out output is different. And the reason why it's different is that on the persistent group side, because our data frame that is going into the slice head function is grouped, then slice head is grabbing slicing one row per group versus here, it's just giving us one row. Another example of this is um, one of my favorite packages, I would say, when I'm doing reporting is the GT package. And it has a really nice functionality that if you feed in group data frames to it, it will give you a table that sort of has these, like, as you can see, these rows that are sort of, um, subheaders, I guess, per group, which is neat, uh, but might be unexpected if that is not what you were intending to do, if that is, if you did not intend for your uh, data frame to be grouped going into it. So this is what the output would look like if my data frame wasn't grouped. The exact same output, right? The numbers are exactly the same. It's just how GT is handling a group data frame versus a non-group data frame. So how do we handle groups? One option is what we did before. I can say, yeah, I want to drop the groups once you summarize and give me the uh, mean body weights per species and sex, just drop them. I don't need them anymore. Or I can say explicitly keep them where I actually keep my data frame grouped by um, both of the variables in case I want to actually continue uh, sort of using a group data frame for further operations. And there are a couple other options as well, like keep last and stuff like that. Alternatively, what you can say is, I don't want persistent groups. When I wanna group things, I just wanna do them in the fu summarize function that I'm using. And then if I want things grouped again, I'll do it again. So in this case, what we're doing is instead of group by, we're saying in summarize, I can say group by one of the variables or group by multiple variables where I can feed a vector into it and get the same output. And you can see that same output in terms of the numbers, I mean, but you can see that none of these data frames are grouped ultimately. So we are basically doing per operation grouping as opposed to persistent grouping. Um, so what is, I mean, how do you choose between these two? I don't know, I think whichever you want is the important thing. Um, I think the important, the reason why the by functionality has been added is because this, um, as much as the output that we've been seeing signals, there are groups here, it's very easy to miss that, particularly easy to miss it if you tend to write really long pipelines. And it can introduce errors, again, down the pipeline that can be hard to debug or unexpected results like that GT output that we were seeing. So group by is not superseded and not going away. And if you have your own sort of methods for successfully dealing with the persistent grouping, then you should continue using that. But if this has been a problem that you sort of encounter yourself running it into, it might be worthwhile to try per operation grouping. I will say that some of the verbs take by instead of dot by, and I just, I don't know. It is what it is. There is a technical reason for it. I think it's a little unfortunate, to be perfectly honest. But they come with informative errors when you do dot by instead of by. So at least it can sort of help you correct things. And in my heart, I am hoping that that bullet point can go away sometime, but I'm not sure technically how feasible that is. Important to note that dot by always returns an ungrouped data frame. So that's why we're calling it a per operation grouping. And 
Another important thing is that you can't just create variables on the fly like you could with group by. So with group by, you could almost sort of skip a mutate step and create a variable that you want to group by. Frankly, I find code like this hard to read and hard to debug and hard to come back to. So I think that this is not a loss, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and um, another thing is that dot by doesn't sort grouping keys. So I will actually switch over to the previous slide for a second to show what I mean by that. Um, so over here, we're using dot by, and you can see that our, um, the order of the species is Adelie, Jantu, and Chinstrap. So that's in the order in which they appear in the data frame, not alphabetical order. However, if we look at the um, output of group by, here we go, we can see that it's Adelie, Chinstrap, and Gentoo. So they have been alphabetized. Um, so the dot by argument won't do the alphabetization. So that might be another thing where you're thinking, I expected my results to be exactly the same just how I approach grouping differently, and that's not 100% true. Your results, in a way, will be slightly different because they might be ordered differently. All right. Um, as a teaching tip, and I can't say this super authoritatively because I have not yet taught with dot by, so I almost want to say teaching idea instead of a tip, but I think the important thing would be for to choose one grouping method and sort of stick to it throughout, um, particularly because the functionality is the same. Ultimately, um, especially for new learners, I would pick one and stick with it. And for more experienced learners, maybe particularly those who are like designing their own functions and packages, I think this tells a nice story of sort of evolution and, um, and you can sort of go through the differences of each output like I have done here and think about, you know, how do we choose which way to approach um, the same problem. Um, a couple other quality of life improvements for case when and if else. Um, the all else um, option in case when being denoted by dot default and also less being less strict about value type for uh, both of these functions. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, here are two uh, sort of contrived examples where I'm creating a new variable X in my data frame DF and I have three conditions and I just happen to pick that the values are character strings. Um, and previously you would have to say here are a few conditions and all else if none of those conditions match, so that's why we said true. Um, and if that needed to be an NA for some reason, you would have to say that's not just NA, but a character type NA. Um, with recent improvements, we have sort of two new things that we can do. Instead of that true, you can actually just use a dot default argument, um, and you don't have to worry about matching the NA type. So it could look um, something like this. Um, so what I'm going to do is first, I've calculated two things, the 25th and 75th percentile of um, body mass. I've also introduced a new function here, reframe, um, which sort of does like a summarize like move, but instead of just outputting one row uh, per group, it's outputting multiple rows per group. So these are the, just these two magic numbers that I want to take a note of. I'm going to use these in a case when statement, my 25th and 75th percentiles. So with case when, I can do something like this. Uh, even though what I'm creating this categorical variable um, that is character, I don't have to specify NA character for the values that were NAs. And for my last option, instead of true, I can just give a dot default. How big an improvement is this? Um, I would say that if you perhaps have had to teach case when many times, you might think that is an improvement. If you're sort of writing case when arguments yourself and you're a pretty experienced R user, I'm not sure how big an improvement that is. Um, I do think that the NA type, um, at least for me, 
I don't often think about, oh, I need to match my NA, care, uh, NA type when I write these statements, and I often will be sort of stopped in my tracks with an error message and then have to fix things. So I think that is a big quality of life improvement. And that similarly works with if else as well. So here I'm creating um, a new variable um, that basically sort of adds a unit to my body mass. And you can see that the first um, sort of the condition for true is a character string, and I can again get away with just saying if the value is NA, just make it NA as opposed to NA character. Um, from a teaching perspective, I think it, being able to omit the NA character and friends is a good, uh, an important improvement, um, mostly because I think it's you know, something like if else or case one is so useful to learn about and to teach about pretty early on in uh, sort of work doing data analysis. And I would say earlier than thinking about different types of NAs, which are important, but not necessarily the first thing you need to learn to start analyzing data. And a few more things. Um, there, are, there are a few new uh, functions that you might look into, like case match, which further simplifies your case when code. Um, being able to select columns inside a mutate or summarize with a new function pick, and also some reproducibility and performance updates to arrange. These I cross my path a little less regularly than the others, so I sort of left it at, feel free to read about them. Um, and lastly, or actually second to last quickly, let's talk about TidyR. A um, few more updates in TidyR as well, but I wanna highlight specifically one of them, which is um, uh, a set of functions that supersede. And what I mean by supersede is we recommend you prefer them over them, um, though the older functions are not going away, called um, sort of separate functions. And you can sort of see in this table, we can separate with a delimiter, we can separate by position, or we can separate by regular expression. And we can separate to make columns where we go wider, or we can separate to make rows where we go longer, sort of like pivot wider and pivot longer. So here's an example of someone who collected data and did so in a really annoying way where they have, um, oh, apologies, I really should, these IDs should have been one, two, three. They're not going to harm anything in our uh, example, but they should now say one. But so we have three penguins and we have some description column about them. So what we might want to do is we might wanna split this into multiple columns. So I could do something like, just split it into two columns, so separate, wider, delim. This basically is what separate looked like previously as well, frankly. But we can see lots of sort of like added uh, text here, right? Speci the word species being repeated or the word island being repeated is entirely unnecessary. And you could stop here and say, I know how to remove certain text strings, I, I'll do that with a mutate and I'll be done. And if that's you, that's great. If this is you, first of all, kudos to you, it's not always me, but if you like writing regular expressions like as a thrill, you can do that. Um, and you can say, I want to separate now with a regular expression. And if you tend to work with data where a column tends to um, incorporate information about a lot of things, this tends to be, so the example in the documentation for this is for example about um, some census data from the US where they'll have a column of a numeric string and actually if you parse it, it, it tells you something about the census block and the address, the state, so on and so forth. So if you tend to work with data like that, this can be incredibly useful. And you can see that instead of a delimiter, we basically have a pattern we're specifying. And we're saying that the first thing you see will be species. And then, you know, grab the next word after that until the comma. And then there's going to be a comma and then the next thing you see will be an island and a dash after it, and then grab everything else after that. And it basically will put it in place. And chances are, if you're having to do this, chances are these are a little bit more complex than what I have here. As I said, I just don't find it all that thrilling myself to write regular expressions. So I gave a simpler example here to illustrate the concept, uh, but the idea is that it gives you a lot more power to genuinely uh, separate these things. 
Um, and then there's enhanced reporting when things fail. So this is what the separate function looked like previously. It had things like, what if I had extra things? What should I do with them? Or uh, what if I didn't have enough things? How should I fill in the boxes? And now you actually have, again, similar to that, um, the um, unmatched cases uh, example that I gave, an option you can use that you would never want in your final code, but can be incredibly helpful when you're actually developing code, which is an argument, of, uh, which is an option of debug. So you can say, I wanna just show me what is going wrong where, instead of just telling me in which row and making me scroll through my data frame to try to find. And once you sort of run your code in that debug mode and you can see a summary of what might be going wrong, you can then decide, okay, if I have two few pieces, should I align them at the beginning or should I align them at the end? If I have too many pieces, should I drop them or should I merge them? So some of the functionality is similar to what we had before, but this idea of erroring out or debugging help you with a little bit more defensive coding. And as a teaching tip, I would say that particularly if we tend to teach folks who come from spreadsheet background, um, and I am one of those, I first learned how to do data analysis in Excel as an actuary, then I learned R. And you know, if, you're, if you work with folks who do text to columns in Excel, they know very well that there are many ways of splitting that text into columns. This is true for like Google Sheets users as well. So, even though it looks like new functionality and like extra functionality, this is actually something that folks encounter in other avenues as well. And this is just sort of like putting a name to it in R. All right, one quick thing um, with ggplot2, where if you use, if you have lines and you set the size to make them thicker, now it will give you this um, sort of warning and say you should use line width instead. And I did this. I wanted to show this to you, um, just to end things on a light note, just check your teaching materials thoroughly to not make a fool of yourself when teaching, because I feel like just went through an entire academic year of standing in front of my slides with a warning saying use line width instead. All right, um, a few other things. There is better string R and tidy R alignment. Um, there's an ability now to distinguish between NA in levels and NA in values in forecasts. There is new and more straightforward to learn and teach API for the Arvest package for web scraping and shorter, more readable, and in some cases, faster SQL queries in dbplyr if you tend to go between databases and R often. And a few more. And if you want to keep up with these, if you actually want to keep up with them real at real time, the Tidyverse blog is a good place to read with each package um, sort of update or upcoming updates where we ask for feedback. This is where we post things. And there's also, it's a good place to learn about other Tidyverse adjacent development, which is uh, things like Tidy Model or WebR. And if you haven't heard about what that is, I do recommend reading that blog post. I won't ruin it for you. Um, if you're looking for a more comprehensive overview of everything that's like current to date with data, R for data science, uh, second edition, I literally turned in the last edits on my flight here today. So I think it should be going to print soon. Um, and thank you so much. The slides are here on the top link and the code uh, that I've gone through is in this GitHub repository. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, good. If there's any questions, just let us know and move along. Hi. Hi. Um, in your discussion about uh, joins, I noticed you didn't mention anything about keys. Mm -hmm. One, a lot of problems that I've seen uh, in working with databases is the lack of a unique key. And so quite often you get this exploding data, which you talked about. Uh, but also missing data and this sort of stuff. Is there any reason why you, you haven't talked about keys? Um, so I haven't used the word key specifically, that's right, but those basically would be what you are passing into the by function or the yeah. or the by argument or the join by function. Yeah. yeah, and and I guess in the case of the exploding rows that we saw, that was sort of like being um, sort of 
not careful about what makes a distinct key. Um, but I guess in this case, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you don't need to have a single column that is a unique key identifying things. Uh, you can simply pass multiple variables that make up a unique key. Yeah, I, I guess it comes from a diagnosis uh, perspective that, um, you know, I, I checked over SAS code quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the big problems was the lack of unique key. And so they used to drop the duplicate variables, values, mm -hmm. uh, which was terrible. Yeah. Which lost a lot of data. Uh, and of course, when somebody came back and there was a sort involved, mm -hmm. they get different results. And it's all because they didn't have a unique key. And I, I think it's quite important as a concept to think, okay, I've got a problem with my data set. Is it because I'm not identifying how to link the data sets? Um, yeah, anyway, that's my Right, point. yeah, and the relationship argument that I mentioned where I've given an example of a many-to-many -many relationship, it will take other options like one-to-many or many-to-one that I think would help address some of that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I had a question about the, the separate sort of functions. Mm -hmm. You had this nice table that was like a two by three layout uh, and there was one that was missing that was separate longer regex. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, and I realise that didn't exist previously either. Um, is there any reason why you can't do that? Because I've actually had a couple of occasions where I've wanted to. Um, so it doesn't currently exist. I am not 100% sure of a technical reason why. Um, I think one of the things is that we haven't come up ourselves with examples where that was useful, but I would say that will be the sort of thing where especially if you have a use case for it to chime in on the issues for TIDR. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's pretty niche and obscure and was horrifying data to work with, but... Um, you know, yeah, I think that... Niche and obscure is equally valid as not. I think that I think actually being able to find real examples of those is so helpful for thinking through sort of enhancements as such. If you think about it, the separate function was a very naive approach to a real problem, but it didn't address any of these like things that might feel niche and obscure. But then when you think about it and look at the issues, like there are at least a hundred people struggling with the same thing. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is about the group by enhancement, uh, whether there's been some kind of um, a performance enhancement behind it as well. Um, there is their performance enhancement. I am unable to answer that question authoritatively. So I do not know. Um, I do know that it is not slower. But I don't, I, I believe the original sort of um, motivation for it wasn't performance. It was the issue that we talked about, this like group sort of lingering around silently was the original motivation. And the dot by argument should not have, did not make things slower, but has it made things faster? I'm not sure. I do know that there were comments about performance in the blog posts though. So that would be a place to look, but I don't know off the top of my head. So I actually have a question as yeah. well. So you, there's so many new kind of functions as well as arguments you're introducing, which I like some of them, like case match, mm -hmm. the join, uh, inequality join. I'm actually wondering the process that beha happens behind the scenes of how you decide like what is going to be like a available function, what's going to be available argument. I wonder if you can share a bit of yeah. the process. Yeah, so there are a few ways that this happens. Sometimes it is a sort of a minor fix and one person in the team implements it and another reviews it because like there was an issue open and a few thumbs up and a few people chiming in saying, yes, this would be good. But for example, for something like this, and also this enhancement for the separate functions went hand in hand with one of, that I didn't get into detail, which was the alignment of functions in string R and tidy R that deal basically with character strings. Because if you think about this whole separate thing is about splitting character strings oftentimes. Um, there is a um, process that is uh, sort of inspired by Python's, I believe, PEPs, where you sort of like propose 
a, an enhancement or a change or an update, and then a, you do a write-up. So someone from the Tidyverse teams does a write-up. It's uh, the repo is called Tidy Up, so it's under the um, Tidyverse organization. And so some ideas develop there, and we actually. Uh, we have weekly meetings where someone will present on it. And especially for something like this, I'm making up a number, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was like three or four separate like presentations where we discuss what is the right syntax, what's the right API for it, what are edge cases we're missing or not missing. And then, a, uh, you know, there's a proposal that's written uh, that a couple people on the team will be like, okay, I'm sort of a signatory to this proposal. I can see how this is valuable. Um, and then for big updates like this one and also many of the deep wire updates, um, one of the team members will often write a blog post sort of soliciting feedback from the community. So while the package is still in development, um, sort of soliciting feedback, and then if sort of like that feedback is feeling like, okay, there's enough, like people can sort of see how this would be improve their workflows, um, ultimately things get merged in. Um, and then sometimes things get merged in, merged in that really like piss people off because like they give a message or something. And it's really a balancing game of how many people's like maybe niche problems that have we been able to solve because they work with this like, you know, incredibly useful but awfully formatted government data set versus a few people need to read messages. So it's really a balancing game and I don't think the goal isn't necessarily to make every single user happy necessarily, but I think two goals are sort of making things so that we don't lose functionality um, and also uh, making things so that functionality is consistent across packages. Because as you can imagine, as the number of people who work on the packages and the functionality of the packages grow, sometimes things diverge and it's useful to sort of take a pause and take a look at, okay, we have these character string things happening in two packages. Like how do we make sure this is not super confusing uh, to users? And so issues from, uh, people who do data science, like who actually do analysis are really helpful. And I will say that um, hearing from educators who actually have to articulate this and teach it to new learners who ask the most critical questions of like, why did you say that the other day and you're saying this today are also incredibly helpful for finding those like misalignment cases. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so uh, there's a question online, but maybe this one. I was going to ask the question that Emmy asked, so I'll ask a follow-up one, which is, what can we expect to see in the next edition of Tony? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, I let me try to think if there's like something I know for sure. That's a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for it off the top of my head. And I think it's because over the last couple months, I've been so like in the mindset of catching up with what's there in terms of the book that I haven't done a whole lot of a look ahead. I don't think we have a big tidy up like this that's sitting there. I do know that um, there's quite a bit of work in terms of sort of performance enhancements that happen uh, with Deepwire particularly. And I will admit that I tend to be like, I think they're like super crucial, but they don't, like I personally don't get affected by them a lot. Um, and so I tend to be a little bit behind the curve when it comes to performance stuff. Um, so I don't have a great answer for it. So question from online. Um, so there's a theme set function in ggplot to override the default. Um, would something similar for dplyr be a good idea? Um, set default grouping behavior and oh. circles. Um, good question. So I am a big fan of that theme set function, particularly for things like writing a report or doing a presentation where I can just set that at the beginning and I don't have to keep adding sort of theme arguments. Um, I can see how um, setting some of these as an option can be useful. I can also see how that can 
if it's not as explicit as theme set where you do it sort of like, there's things where you can do theme set versus there's options that you can set. And generally, I would think that the options is not the way to go because they tend to be sort of not so transferable between uh, folks like for reproducibility purposes. Off the top of my head, I don't see why that wouldn't be a good idea. So I would say that would be a good issue to open to see if there is like sort of traction or if others can think of sort of reasons not to. Um, so another question online is, are there any plans to introduce tidyverse paradigm to Python since RStudio is now called Posit? <laughs> um, so I, d I can say that um, on the tidyverse team, um, there is Michael who works on Shuba, which is sort of a dplyr port to Python. There's also Hassan who works on plot nine, which is like a ggplot2 port to Python. So in terms of supporting open source work that sort of take this design philosophy and implement it in Python, the company has made an investment in it. And actually just like personally, I can say they're hearing from them in terms of their development process and how things sort of ha similar conversations happen in Python land has been super informative for me and I think has made the team better. I don't think the goal is like, I can't speak for the whole company or for like the whole team as a whole, but I don't think the goal is like, let's make everything tidyverse, like just like let's have a tidyverse package in Python as well. But I think that sort of like being able to have those folks on the team has been really good for making sure there's like a two-way communication happening because it is really easy to sort of just be in your own land and be developing here and be not aware of advances happening elsewhere. Thank you so much for the talk. I found it really useful. Um, I want to follow up on one of the questions about um, uh, the joining functions. Because uh -huh. um, you had a few examples there where you were showing how you can use the unmatched and uh -huh. the multiple arguments um, in conjunction with the type of join yeah. um, function you were using. Um, when I was learning about this a few days ago, I also saw um, another one that briefly popped up, um, relationship. You're right. Uh, I was hoping you could help me understand when I would use the relationship argument versus the other methods that you outlined of the other arguments and function names. So one of the ways I mentioned the relationship argument was... Um, so if there are many to many relationships, Previously, this would not give this warning. It would silently just sort of give the output and say, hey, you asked me to join by this column, so I joined by that column. Um, so now there is this warning that says, this may not be what you intended to do, or at least we want you to be explicit about what you intended to do. And so you can set relationship many to many to say, yeah, no, that is exactly what I intended to do. In other cases, you can set this to one to many or many to one. And similarly, if that was what was sort of identified as a potential problem here, the warning would have said, if a one to many relationship is expected, set it to that. So it's sort of making, you, making it explicit in your code. Um, and it's in a way using warnings to train you to sort of be better or more sort of um, aware of what you're doing, which I think is good. I will say though that um, at a recentish meeting, one of the things I did bring up was that I think we tend to use in R in general for sure, but even in the tidyverse where we sort of talk about consistency, we tend to use like warnings and messages a little bit interchangeably sometimes. And personally for me, my vision was that, I don't know if this will work out. My vision is that we use one for call to attention and one for call to action. And right now they're sort of mismatched. And I find that really sort of difficult. I mean, I can just like overlook it when I am doing stuff, but particularly from a teaching perspective to say, why is, you know, the fact that 
you have NAs when you do a ggplot a message, but this is a warning. Like, well, or why isn't it the other way around? And there isn't always a consistent reason for it. There definitely isn't all of our, but then you don't expect that because, you know, all sorts of packages are out there. But I think that sort of consistency is something we would like to see in the tidyverse. So I think we'll do a bit of thinking about this idea of like using messaging in general, generically, to teach you to be uh, more intentional in what you're doing, but then making sure that we have a good tagline for, and if it wants you to do blah, it'll be a message. If it's a like, call to attention, it's a message. If it's a call to action, it's a warning, or something like that, uh, so that we can sort of see more consistency across the various messages we're seeing. That's my dream. <laughs> so maybe last question. Thank you for the talk. I have a follow-up question actually to Emmy and Rob's, um, also kind of about package development. So on one of the slides you kind of mentioned, um, you know, there are some things that are useful to teach students who uh, like are just learning mm -hmm. data like analysis, and then other things that are kind of more useful for people who might be writing their own functions uh -huh. and packages. And as someone who like writes, tries to write packages, um, the speed of development in the tidyverse is very hard to keep up with, um, but there's also obviously a lot that's appealing about the kind of de design philosophy. Um, do you have any approaches to like how to kind of learn the tidyverse, mm -hmm. um, like design philosophy, like where to start, good resources? Yeah, so style.tidyverse.org, I think, is the booklet, I will say for now. I think Hadley will write that book at some point if he stops writing other things. Um, so that's about sort of tidyverse design principles. And some of it is very simple things like, oh, have line breaks after pluses in your GG plus. But some of it is indeed about uh, sort of how do we message? How do we warn? Like how to construct an error message? So this year, one of the things I didn't mention, and you know, it's a shame I didn't because Lionel did a lot of work on like better error messages. It turns out that's like a really like technically hard problem. Very easy for me to criticize when an error message doesn't sound like normal, right? I'm like, this doesn't read well, but turns out solving that is a technically hard problem at times to identify exactly what function is resulting in the error, for example. So there's some stuff about that there. Um, I will also say that, um, like you saw by example, when Rob asked like, what's next? I'm like, I, I'm on the tidyverse team and I don't know the answer to that. So keeping up with the tidyverse, yeah, you can read the blog, but I, I don't know that that is a goal to aspire to. Cause I mean, if you think about it, there are, you know, 10 plus humans whose full-time job is to work on the tidyverse. Of course, like there's you know, a lot of development. But I do think that keeping up with the blog or something and sort of looking at it as tags in terms of this is the sort of data I tend to work with, what's happening in that space and scoping it that way is a lot more doable. So when I say, for example, I'm not that in tune with the performance updates, I mean, yeah, maybe I should be, but at the same time, doesn't cross my path as often, but like not being in tune with what's new and tidy are would be a lot more devastating for like what I try to do on a daily basis. So I think figuring out what pieces of this vast sort of like ecosystem touch you most regularly and keeping up with that and reading about that is helpful and the style guide is helpful in terms of the design process as well. Mm -hmm. We will be heading out to dinner after this. So if you like to have more questions, maybe you can actually ask then. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much and please give a hand. Thank you.